I'm going to start off by showing you three pictures. And these three pictures all represent an end game. And the end game is always sparkly and shiny. And we look at it and we're like, I want that. So this is a drawing done by Pablo Picasso. And as the story goes, he was in a cafe. And someone went up to him and said, you're Pablo Picasso. I will pay you. Can you draw me something? And so he took a napkin and he sketched it out. And he's like, that'll be $100,000. And the guy was like, are you joking? That literally just took you like two minutes. And he said, no, you're wrong. It took me 40 years. This is a picture of my family on St. Patrick's Day. And I have this absolutely amazing love of my life husband and these four kids. But again, this for me is the end game. It's the end of the story. And what you don't see in this picture is all the many failed relationships that I had before I met my husband. <laughs> you didn't see that I tried to get my neighbor to fall in love with me by writing myself fake love notes in my yearbook. So he would say, who wrote those? And I'm like, <laughs> No one you need to know about. Um, I don't have to tell you about my high school boyfriend who took a summer job at a carnival and literally fell in love and ran off with an acrobat. And I really was sure that I found my true love when I got a diamond ring put on my finger the first time, but that didn't work either. And then I met my husband, and he's just absolutely my whole world. But what you don't see in this picture is the years that we struggled with infertility, the time that I lost a twin and vanishing twin syndrome, all the many thousands of thousands of dollars and failed procedures and failed treatments. You don't see that. But what you see is what I got in the end. Now this is a picture of my district. And a lot of people want to come to the district where I'm the assistant superintendent of schools because they see this beautiful picture of where we are in our UDL journey. But just like the Picasso and just like my family, this takes years to build and lots of mistakes and lots of failure. So there's six things about the district that I'm so incredibly proud that my colleagues and I have been able to build since I came five years ago. The first is in the state of Massachusetts, our accountability status is something called the Pupil Performance Index. And in the past five years, that number in the state for students with disabilities went from a 52 to a 50 there was a downward trend. In Groton Dunstable, we went from a 29 to a 79, which was the highest growth in the entire state. 2% of schools every year are highlighted as significantly exceeding targets for all accountability groups. All of our schools made that list. We have a 92% full inclusion rate for students with disabilities. And if that doesn't seem that impressive, the national rate is 62. And then last year, our students with disabilities on our high stakes MCAS test, 53% of them scored advanced in math. Not only do we care about student academics, but we also care about including the whole child. And so we were one of only 131 schools in the entire nation that were um, actually awarded this national banner for Special Olympics for unified varsity sports and then a full engagement in the school community. And this is not just trying to like meet the outcomes of our students, it is we give uh, faculty PD uh, two half days a month, and during the last one we said, is this PD truly allowing you to meet the needs of all learners and move us towards our district vision? And 87% strongly agreed. So that is the picture that people see, and that is what you want to see when you come to Groton Dunstable. But that's sparkly, and it's shiny, and people forget all the hard work and mistakes and failure that we had to go through to get there. So my slide advancer is not going. Thank you so much. So what we know from the National Implementation Research Network is that to fully implement anything, it will take about four to seven years. And the definition of full implementation is the tipping point of more than 50% of your staff. So this work isn't easy. And when I consult, people always say to me, you know what, I just want to see it and then we'll be able to do it. Okay, just give me a lesson plan and then we're all going to be fine. Or what's the protocol that you use? Can you give me a list of steps that you used? And you would be better off asking me, how many times did you really mess up? Because that's the magic of why we're so proud of where we are. 
So the first step of UDL success is paint your picture, and the picture for me was never UDL. The picture for me was inclusion. It was eliminating inequities. It was to broaden the meaning of success. It was to create conditions of nurture in every classroom. It was to create teachers who had the autonomy to be an architect of designing and learning. Okay? And UDL was the vehicle that got us there, but another part of the vehicle that got us there were all the mistakes and all the failures and all the setbacks. So I want to tell you about three of my biggest setbacks, just so you know, I know with 100% certainty you will fail at UDL. And that is okay. That is a part of the journey. And the only real failure is not rising from the ashes of those mistakes. So these are my most epic failures in Groton Dunstable. The first one I like to call if you give a kid a cupcake. So when I came to the district, we had no curriculum. Like, I was talking about UDL, and I'm like, yes, so you take this curriculum, and you identify what could be the barriers to access and engagement, and then from there, you think about the options and choices, and they're like, ah, uh, but we don't have curriculum. Like, we literally don't have anything. So my elementary teachers were making their own lessons and making their own curriculum every single day. And so I was like, you know what, I can fix this. So we didn't have any money to do it, so I was like, you know what? I consult, I will go consult on behalf of the district, and I donated over $20,000 to the district to buy teachers' curriculum. And I was like, okay, what do you want? Like, do you want math? Do you want ELA? They're like, we want both. I'm like, yes! And this is kind of like when your kid says to you, I really want a cupcake. And you're like, it's probably not a good idea. It's probably too many cupcakes. I knew that giving teachers two full curriculums without PD was a bad idea. But sometimes we think success is saying yes. And so I said yes. Now this is a video of my daughter Aylin after she had too many cupcakes. Yeah, yeah, snow white everywhere, yeah. So it'll come, it'll come. So, but what we're trying to do here is we're trying to realize that like, you know sometimes like this isn't a great idea. So I actually like went out to my staff and I said, okay, I'm gonna have you fill out a survey because I'm feeling like, you know, if we get these two new curriculums, we might not know how to use them. And they're like, no, we really need it. I even sent out a survey and said, like, let me know, are you on board with this curriculum adoption? And everyone said yes. So there was like literally newspaper articles, like assistant superintendent fixes curriculum with bubble gum and tape. And I'm feeling like, yes, like they know I'm literally willing to do anything. Two weeks into the next school year, I am served a grievance. And the grievance is that I have forced curriculum upon a school and that it needs to cease and desist immediately. No one gave me a heads up. No one called me and told me it was coming. And I was devastated. But I like put on my big girl pants and I said, you know what, let me come to every school and just hear you out. Let's solve the problem. And when I went to the school, I was completely ambushed. So every single staff member was in a room together. They handed me a list of everything they were upset about at the district. I sat at a stool and wanted to cry, but basically said, okay, I hear you. Here's your avenue. What are we going to do to fix it? And, and what I've learned a lot of the time is that people are really good at pointing out problems and people don't like to offer solutions. Because as an administrator, I am open to solutions. As a teacher, you are open to solutions. When a kid says, I can't do it this way, well then how can you do it? How can we do this together? And I got in my car after that meeting and I thought like, this isn't the place for me. Like I literally like took my vacation time and sacrificed everything to get this curriculum. And then I said, get over yourself, Novak. You knew it wasn't going to work. And as a leader, that's on you. And we have to take responsibility for those failures and those mistakes. And I went back to them and I said, you are right. I knew it wasn't going to work. If you give a kid a cupcake, you know they're going to be going down the stairs on a mattress, which is what she was doing. Okay? She like literally took her mattress and was like, woo! And I was like, well, that's, a, that's an aggressive move, right? So. But the reality is, is this work is really, really hard. So like steal yourself and remember your picture. Because my picture was, you know, I needed to have all students educated together. I needed teachers to be able to be architects of their learning. And to do that, I had to provide them with tools. 
Now, the next big thing, we call it busgate in my district, but it was essentially, this sometimes costs money. Sometimes you want to buy more flexible furniture. You need better assistive technology. You want more devices in the hands of kids. You need instructional coaches. And here's the thing, none of us are getting any more money. So the question is, what are you willing to cut? And you have to make those hard decisions and know that regardless of the decision you make, it will be wildly unpopular with about 49% of people. Okay, so Busgate was, we had three amazing ways that we were gonna save money to get everything on our needs assessment. The first, you know what? Let's just reduce our bus fleet by like six buses. Some of the kids might be on the bus a little longer. Who's gonna notice? <laughs> People noticed, okay? And um, so, so we know how that goes, right? I mean, we had public forums. We were getting slandered on Facebook. You know, that like, we don't care about kids, we want them to be on the bus all day, and in no way could be like, but, but we, we were able to literally hire an instructional coach at every school. But, but no one wants to hear that, because kids were on the bus for 27 minutes instead of 20. The other thing that we did is we closed down central office. We said, let's take one for the team, right? Like, let's be willing to cut our own office. Let's sell the building, let's move into the schools. We're like, look it, we're saving all this money. And they're like, why are you in the schools? Seems like a lot of oversight. And then some people had to move their classrooms to get us in there, okay? Every time I have done anything to make a change, I have literally gone back to my house to the margaritas, okay? <laughs> and to say, like, why am I doing this? But I go back to paint the picture. The third one was that we decided that we were going to outsource our custodial staff. And I don't need to talk about how that went. Now, my biggest joy of Groton Dunstable, and also I think my biggest failure, was proportional scheduling. So if we believe in inclusion and we believe that we can design a learning environment that meets the needs of all students equally, then I want them to be balanced classes that look like the school. Now, proportional scheduling is that you basically make every classroom look like the district. So you're 15% of students with disabilities. That means every class we run will have 15% of students with disabilities. Okay, we're not gonna load any classes. But that also means that you need to eliminate your leveling and your gifted programs and your small group. And this is never, ever popular. Okay, but what it has done Although I've had to have so many meetings explaining that like I would never make a decision that I thought was going to negatively impact any child. Our teachers can challenge and support everyone equally. But like I go home at night sometimes and I read the comments about myself on Facebook and it's devastating. And so when people come to our district and they say we want to visit, how do you do this? You have to steal yourself for failure because you are deconstructing a system that sucks and doesn't work for kids, but that people are used to and they buy into. And so what you have to do sometimes is you just have to laugh, okay? That is how I've been able to get through this. It's like you look at your failures and you have to laugh. And when I look back at like trying to have a family, I remember there was one day we went to Chili's for dinner and somebody had a baby and I had to leave. I had to leave, I couldn't be in the restaurant anymore. And I left my food on the table and I said to my husband, I have to leave. And I walked out and we look back at that now and we kind of laugh about it because when the kids get up at three in the morning and they vomit on our bed, he's like, remember Chili's? <laughs> and it's all worth it again because the failure is what makes the success so great. So recently I learned about this ridiculous thing called laughing yoga. And um, I'm gonna show you this quick video. This is 100% legit. And you're gonna like watch it and think that like I found this on the onion, this is real. Okay, so could I see our laughing yoga video? Please, please work. I, I'm gonna have to do it and it's not gonna be as good, but I can, I can roll, I can roll if I need to. Essentially, laughing yoga is this concept that like you can force yourself to laugh and be happy through exercise. Like I'm a runner, no one wants to get up in the morning and run, and sometimes after some epic failure, you don't feel like smiling, you don't feel like laughing, and this concept of laughing yoga is that, oh yeah baby, here we go, it's warming up. 
the concept of laughing yoga is that you can actually like force yourself to like flood your body with the same chemicals that you have when you're actually laughing. And so there's like a hundred different laughing exercises and there's just one of them that I was going to show you where he basically says sometimes in life you just have to laugh. And so what you do is you like go up to an envelope, right? And you're opening up an envelope, right? So I need everybody to stand up. Come on. You're going to love me and hate me for it. Okay, so you're going to open an envelope. Now, what he does in the video is he says, you open it up and you see a visa bill that you can't pay. <laughs> okay? Now, but what I want you to do is I want you to put inside this envelope your greatest UDL failure. Okay? The time you designed a lesson and it absolutely bombed. Okay? The time that parents said, um, why aren't you teaching the kids? Why are they making all these choices? You know, the time that you got the grievance, the time that you got the complaints, okay, they're, they're numerous. And really, success is all about how do you overcome those, okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to open up your, your UDL failure, and then you're going to show it to people, and you're going to laugh. Now, if you saw the video, you would see it's as ridiculous as you think it would be. But you're showing everyone, okay? So you're going to walk around, and you're going to be like, ha, 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 And then we're all going to do it. And what ends up happening is it's so dumb and so ridiculous that you'll start laughing for real about the fact that you're laughing for fake. Okay? So, are we ready? Everyone, open up the envelope, show someone your UDL failure, and laugh! <laughs> okay. All right, so coming back together. Next slide, please. So we started with a picture. And when you paint this picture again, it's where do you want to end up? But as we walk around and we share our UDL successes during this conference, we cannot forget to share our UDL failure. Because when we don't, we give like this false belief that this work is easy. That you just get like a dynamic leader and it happens. You just get a good teacher and it happens. We cannot Pinterest our way into deconstructing our systems, okay? And so what I challenge all of you to do, what my call to action is, is to recognize that success and failure are braided together. You cannot separate them. And as we go on, please, please be vulnerable and open about sharing your UDL failures so we recognize that when we get it right, when we paint this picture at the end, it was so, so worth the ride. Thank you so much.